Hi, I hope you've had a good week. Uh, we're glad you're here to worship with us today. May God speak to you today through this service. Let us uh, praise the Lord and join together singing our opening hymn of praise. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder Consider all the world thy hands have made I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder Thy power throughout the universe displayed then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander And hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur And hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing Sent him to die, I scarce can take it in That on the cross my burden gladly bearing He bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation And take me home, what joy shall fill my heart Then I shall bow in humble adoration And there proclaim, my God, how great Thou art then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Now let us, as Christians throughout the ages have done, let us witness to our faith as we proclaim the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From hence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. A few weeks ago, I decided to run a couple of errands that did not require getting out of the car. I thought I would use our 05 Toyota that had been sitting quietly in the driveway for several weeks. Errands accomplished. When I returned home, the Ramseys had parked in the driveway, so I opted to park in the street. The next day, I wanted to make a food pickup and decided to drive the 05 to get it out of the street. I'm sure a lot of you have heard that quiet click, click when the key is turned. Your shoulders drop and you suddenly think of or mumble some unintelligible symbol words. On Monday, I called AAA and the dead battery truck appeared in about 15 minutes. The driver opened the hood, hooked up the wires that were attached to a unit about the size of a Jiffy cornbread mix box. I asked if he was checking the battery, and he said, no, I'm jumping the battery. With that, he said that was start the battery in an 18-wheeler. It worked. I signed my name, and he was gone, less than five minutes. I knew that the car had just been sitting there for a while, and I, why I hadn't made an effort to connect, to connect it to a trickle charger. If I had, we wouldn't have needed to jump start the battery. For the past six or seven weeks, I, or we, have not had our spiritual battery charged by interacting with friends in Sunday school, Bible study, or sanctuary services, meetings, practices, or serving those in need. Yes, I'm familiar with that old saying about a church, it's not the building, it is the people. But I believe that all of us people ingredients make a better product when we are mixed together in the bowl at 300 North Air Depot. Your check, though it is physically smaller than that AAA battery pack, juices up our financial battery and makes it possible to accomplish the missions for which we are noted. It also covers the electricity for the coffee pot, the cappuccino dispenser, and the pop machine, which juices up most of us. By continuing to provide our financial support during this time apart, each of us are serving like a trickle charger so that the batteries of the ministries within the four walls of St. Matthew can stay charged and continue ministries that can be done safely. Then when it is safe, we can step right back in where we left off to continue our ministries to the community. We can also continue to reach out beyond our doors by keeping up with our apportionment so that the conference ministries that are essential and can do so safely have funds to continue operations. And ministries such as the camps and campus ministries that have had to be closed can stay charged and be ready to switch back into their mission modes as soon as it is safe. This time apart has provided a lot of time to reflect on and be thankful for the many, many blessings God has provided. To paraphrase Maddie's song last week, give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks, and with a grateful heart, please continue to give. Thank you. I want to thank Paul and Carolyn Speck for that uh, wonderful word 
Once again, I want to thank all of you who have been so faithful. It is because of people like you that the ministries of this church will continue. As a reminder, there are three ways that you can give to the ministries of this church. Of course, you can mail a check to St. Matthew United Methodist Church at 300 North Air Depot, Midwest City, Oklahoma, 73110. You can sign up for a direct deposit at www.stmatthew.org. There you will find a form that you can fill out and you can send to us. On that same web page, you will find a place to give online. Just know that what you give is used to touch the lives of many people here uh, in this community and around the world. Let us pray. Precious Lord, all that we have comes from you. And we pray that what we give will be a blessing to others. Thank you for being so generous to us. Help us to be generous as we give back to you. And may it make an eternal difference. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, sometimes my life just don't make sense at all. When the mountains look so big, and my faith just seems so small. So hold me, Jesus, cause I'm shaking like a leaf. You have been king of my glory, would you be my prince of peace? And I wake up in the night and feel the dark. It's so hard inside my soul I swear there must be blisters on my heart So hold me Jesus Cause I'm shaking like a leaf You have been king of my glory Won't you be my prince of peace Surrender don't come natural to me I'd rather fight you for something I don't really want Than to take what you give that I need And I beat my head against so many walls Now I'm falling down, I'm falling on my knees And the Salvation Army band is playing this hymn and your grace rings out so deep It makes my resistance seem so thin So hold me, Jesus Cause I'm shaking like a leaf You have been king of my glory Won't you be my prince of peace? I'm singing, hold me, Jesus Cause I'm shaking like a leaf You have been king of my glory Won't you be my prince of peace You have been king of my glory Won't you be my prince of
when uh, Ann Jarvis was working to establish Mother's Day as a national event and when her daughter picked up the mantle from her, they were not thinking about um, greeting cards and flowers. Instead, the Methodist women who invented the idea in America wanted to honor mothers in a deeper way. Uh, they were thinking about the work of women and the significant uh, testimony that women could give about the need for peace. Anne Reeves Jarvis organized women's clubs in the 1860s to serve suffering mothers and children. Women came together with their sisters in their locations uh, to respond to the needs that they could see. For Anne, she was in a coal mining part of what is now West Virginia, and uh, she could see the needs of women and children, and she could see the effects of the economy of her day on the people that she cared for. She started mother's clubs, and she taught them about hydration for fevered babies, about sanitation and nutrition. Then the Civil War came along, and they put a field hospital right outside Grafton. Anne recruited nurses for military hospitals, and after the war, formed friendship clubs to promote reconciliation. Anne Jarvis uh, was convinced that mothers, women, but especially mothers, had to work for peace because they could see the ravages of war in their husbands and in their sons in a way that uh, was so focused and so clear that uh, their voices would be uh, powerful. And that's what's at the genesis of the current Mother's Day. Faith was always foremost. When she was older, Ann Jarvis and her daughter Anna became members of Philadelphia's St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church. The daughter Anna became a Sunday school teacher here at, at St. George's, but she's best known for the efforts she made to get Mother's Day recognized as a national observance. She and John Wanamaker, who was a famous retailer here, were the ones that got Woodrow Wilson to sign the petition. Ann Jarvis died in 1905, before an official holiday was in place. But her daughter Anna, who was never a mother herself, stayed true to the purpose of the celebration. She envisioned Mother's Day as a time to write a personal letter to your mother, a time to send her an inexpensive carnation, a flower in which the petals hold tight like a mother's love, and a time to visit or attend church together. She later became an outspoken critic when the special day turned too commercial. She was really aggravated at people that turned that observation into a commercial outlet. So she had a lot to say to Hallmark. She had a lot to say to the Salvation Army that started selling carnations. When she made carnations the symbol of Mother's Day, they sold for pennies. But their price soon went up to $1.50, $2 a piece because people found they could make money off of it. And <laughs> her, her comments about Hallmark are just wonderful. She said, how lazy can you be to buy somebody else's sentiment to hand to your mother? Like one day out of the year, sit down and tell your mother what you really think of her. And she was just furious. And I, I just, I like, love that kind of spunk. She would have been a really interesting person to know. And I like telling the kids about her because it, the history of the church isn't a history of ministers. It's the people that make up the church, and I think there's such a wonderful example of that. And, and besides, you know, making kids think about their mothers is always a, a good thing to do. This video was brought to you. We come to our time of prayer. Uh, if you have a prayer concern, if you would please send that to us. Uh, we will be glad to pray over it. Uh, it's been a blessing to, to have really nice weather. People have been able to get out and work in their gardens and, and, uh, and just time together with family. There's so many joys that we have experienced lately that... Uh, we may not even have considered. But we also know that uh, 
One of the reasons that we come together to pray is we pray for those who uh, have been affected uh, by their health and, and other situations. And so we come today, Father, we ask you that, uh, that your hands would be upon them and that you would bring healing into their lives. So let us gather together and let us pray. Father, we do give you thanks that you are working for, in the lives of those who are suffering from this virus. You are working in the lives of those who are sick, those who have had procedures, and, and all of those who, Father, uh, are recovering from procedures that they've had. Uh, we would, in particular, like to lift up uh, Maria, and, uh, and she's still in the hospital, Father, and she needs our prayers. And there are many others who do as well. And you know who they are. But Father, we ask that you would reach out, uh, that you would just touch them and, and bring um, wholeness to them, to their lives and to their families. We also want to give you thanks for those who are working on the front lines of the pandemic and uh, those who are supporting them in the background. It's been so wonderful to see so many people finding different ways that they can actually help and Father, we just ask that you would give us the wisdom in, in all that we do as we lift up those who are having these procedures and recovering and, and just help us to be safe. We pray for the safety of our medical workers, our first responders, our firefighters, and our uh, police officers, and all of our military. And Father, in this time of uncertainty, give us strength to stay the course. As we pray the prayer your Son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed would be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. This morning we're going to talk about the human body. Our bodies are so fascinating. They are constantly growing and changing. They are constantly becoming new again. Did you know that you are constantly growing new hairs on your head? Every day some of your hairs fall out and some brand new hair starts growing in where the old hair fell out. And you are constantly growing new skin cells. Although we can't see it, we are growing new skin cells all the time. That's why when we cut ourselves, the cut heals after just a few days. We grow brand new skin cells to cover the cut area. We're growing new fingernails all the time too. It takes about six months for a fingernail to grow from its base to its tip. And then we have a brand new fingernail. If we could see the inside of our bodies, we would be able to see that we're constantly growing new blood cells to make more blood. Even the lining in our stomach is changing. Every minute, old cells in the lining of our stomach die out and our body grows some brand new cells to take their place. Every three days, we have a whole new lining in our stomach. Isn't that neat how our bodies and our insides are always becoming brand new? Now, God made our bodies so that they could grow more cells if they need to, so that our bodies can grow and stay healthy. But the Bible says that our hearts and souls can also become brand new too. How does that happen? When Jesus comes into our lives. When we decide to follow Jesus, we learn to think and act the way Jesus would think and act. We learn to love people instead of being mean. We learn to share with other people and care about them instead of being selfish. And we learn to trust God instead of just trusting ourselves. We learn to tell the truth instead of lying. We aren't the same old person we used to be. We're a new person, a more loving person, because we have Jesus in our lives. It's great that God made our bodies so that they can become new again, but it's even better when Jesus comes into our lives. He makes us new people completely. Let's pray together. Repeat back. Dear God, we give you thanks that you are constantly renewing our bodies. Help us to renew our spirit through Jesus. 
in all that we do. We love you, God. Amen. Today's scripture comes from 2 Corinthians, uh, beginning in the 5th chapter, 16th verse. Listen for the word of God. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciled and the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sin against them. And he was committed to us, the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We employ you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, God made him who had no sin be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There was a little leaguer, and um, the coach and, and his, his coach uh, looked down and, and, uh, at this little eager second baseman with uh, desperation in his eyes. Bobby, he said, you know the principle of good sportsmanship that uh, the Little League practices? You know that we don't tolerate temper tantrums and shouting at the umpires or abusive language. Do I make myself clear? Yes, sir, replied the Little Leaguer. Well then, said the coach, would you please explain that to your mother? Now, some of you baseball fans are looking forward to the anticipation of a season sometime this year. And many people love baseball. There was a certain man and his two sons in Tennessee. They'd been looking forward to going to a baseball game for a long time. The Dodgers were coming to Atlanta, Georgia to play the Braves. And this man and his sons were going to be there. They drove most of Saturday to be in Atlanta to see their favorite two teams play. They rushed to check into the motel. In a hurry, they made it to the game just before the first ball was pitched. The problem was when the umpire called, play ball! They were still standing in line. But that really didn't bother them. They knew there were going to be nine full innings of baseball. What they didn't know was that the seats were filling up even as they stood outside. In fact, just before they came to the ticket window, the salesperson put up a sign that says, Sorry, no more tickets. Sell out. They couldn't believe their eyes. The Braves never sold out. This man and his son, sons had traveled most of the day to get there. This was supposed to be their highlight of their vacation. And the man rushed to the window. He pleaded for three tickets, please. But all the lady at the window could say was, I'm sorry, we're sold out. When he tried to explain to the lady how important the game was to him and to his two sons and how far they had driven to be there, the lady said, remember... If you want to be assured of a ticket, to be able to get into an important game, you need to make sure you have a ticket ahead of time. The man knew that she was right. There are some events in life that are so important to us that we should make sure that we have whatever it takes to get in. Recently, the same man Again, learn the power of a ticket. He attended the first game between the new Tennessee Oilers and the Oakland Raiders. He and his sons got there late again, but they were not concerned because they had tickets. 
When they came to row 28 and seats 17 through 19, they found other people in their seats. But they weren't overly anxious. They knew the people would have to move and let them in because, yes, because they had tickets. Jesus told three parables about having the proper tickets. One was about uh, some maidens who uh, were not allowed to attend the wedding party because they had neglected to prepare their lamps with oil, Matthew 25, 1 uh, through 12. Lighted lamps, you see, were their tickets. Another guest was put out of the wedding party because he had either refused or neglected to wear the wedding garments that he had been furnished, Matthew twenty-two eleven 11 through 14. The special garment was his ticket. Then Jesus told of a group of people who refused to come to the king's party because they had other priorities. Luke 14, beginning at verse 15. Those who did not value the ticket or invitation that they had received never enjoyed the blessings of feasting with the Lord. What are the messages for us in these stories of Jesus? And what do they have to do with our text for this day? Notice, first of all, in each case, the king was giving a feast for his people. This means that we, as God's people, are important. And that God wants to give us the very best Jesus assured his disciples, it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, Luke 12, 32. He also said, if you parents know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your heavenly Father want to give you good gifts too? Matthew 7, 11. When Jesus' disciples were face to face with death, Jesus assured them, in my Father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you, John 14. God has blessings in store for God's people. Secondly, notice that the king issued personal invitations to those who would be his guests. What, that's uh, what Christ's coming is all about. Did you understand that? That's what Christ's coming is really all about. A hospital patient was in uh, an accident and was left only with her sense of smell. She couldn't speak. She couldn't hear. She couldn't see. But she could smell. And her mother wanted her to communicate her presence. So she used a perfume the girl would remember as being her mom's. Now, the perfume is not the mother's uh, essential nature, but it is an extension of her real self to communicate on the girl's level. You see, God needed to communicate to you and me on our level. So God became flesh. And as flesh, God reached out God's hand to all who would receive God's invitation. We might say that through the incarnation, God has hand-delivered to each of us an invitation to participate with God in the very best that God has to offer. Can we understand how wonderful a gift this invitation really is? Imagine with me uh, that the invitation has just been placed in your hand. Open it. It reads, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, let each of us look at this invitation and in the place of world and whosoever, put in our own name. For God so loved Ron, 
that he gave his only begotten son, that Ron, who believes on him, should not perish but have everlasting life. I hope you put your name in just as I did. It's a personal invitation for you. Do you feel it? Do you feel God personally inviting you? God has prepared great blessings for God's people. God has given each of us a personal invitation. But there is a third thing we need to note. Jesus recognized that human beings have problems accepting God's offer. We have problems being able to experience the goodness of God. In one of these parables, Jesus illustrated how easy it is for us to miss the best of life because we have priorities that do not include what God knows is best in our lives. What makes Jesus so believable is that the excuses that these invited made for not coming to the feast were very practical activities with which we actually can identify. One person had just bought some land and needed to do a complete uh, transaction on that land. Another one had just uh, bought some oxen and he needed to go try them out. The third person was uh, beginning his honeymoon Uh, When the invitation came. How many of us ignore God's invitation because we have our own priorities? Some of us can identify with the five maidens who were so excited about being invited to be a part of the wedding ceremony that they neglected to put oil in their lamps. Apparently, apparently one of the most primary reasons that they were in the wedding party was to provide light for the event. This makes us ask, what benefits from God am I missing just because I'm not prepared to be used of God when the opportunity arises? A few of us can identify with the guest who was put out because he refused to wear the wedding garment that had been furnished him at the door. When I think of this man losing out just because he insisted that he was going to do it, yeah, you've heard this before, his way. I recall a pastor who was participating in a graveside funeral of a friend. One of the family members asked him to look at the gravestone. The name of the deceased woman was Joyce. He pointed out that Joyce had lived only 34 years. The words on the gravestone told the story. She lived her life her way. C.S. Lewis tells a powerful story. story. He he describes a trip uh, some citizens of hell take to heaven for a visit. Each of the travelers is given the chance to enter heaven by giving up his or her besetting sin. Even the preacher who pastors a thriving congregation in hell is given another chance. But finally, everyone chooses to return to hell. It's their choice. And as Lewis explains it, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell chose. Some of us can identify with the street people in one of the parables Those who were invited at the last minute. The good news is that enough of the street people accepted the invitation to fill the entire banquet hall. The bad news is that no doubt many of them didn't accept the invitation. Or many people didn't accept the invitation because they felt that they were just not worthy. It's sad when people feel unworthy to experience God's grace. 
Just think of all of the blessings of God that we might miss because of our lack of self-esteem or because we are so ashamed of our past disobedience to God. And here is where our text helps us. Here is the great truth we need to leave here knowing. Jesus is our risen Savior. He is our ticket made available for us to experience the goodness, the very goodness of God. The Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthians, many of whom had come to Christ and the church from varying unchristian lifestyles. Paul assures them that they are acceptable to God because of what God has done for them in Christ Jesus. For God took the sinless Christ, he assures them, and poured into him our sins. Then in exchange, he poured God's goodness into us. You and I don't have to be worthy. All we have to do is be joined with Christ Jesus. Christ makes us worthy. Would you like to have one of Jesus' personal invitations to experience the blessings of the Almighty as one of God's special guests? This ticket is offered to you this very day. The Associated Press carried a story recently, Dateline Atlantic City, that begins like this. The Reverend Steve Sinere is on his knees, but he's not praying. And he is definitely not in church. Pushing aside a torn section of chain-link fence, he crawls beneath the boardwalk looking for teenage runaways. Reverend Steve looks up on a ledge where the homeless stash what few belongings they have. Nothing. But someone has been there. He looks down and he finds a handbag, either stolen or lost by some out-of-town gambler. He next pokes his head beneath one of the Atlantic City Beach Patrol lifeguard stands, another favorite to hide out for street people. He's looking for a girl who was there yesterday. He gave her a toothbrush. Peaches. Peaches. You hear? No answer. She's gone. Maybe to duck into a casino to get warm. Maybe to sell her body along Pacific Avenue for money for food. The 47-year-old man searching for these teens is an Eastern Orthodox priest who works with Covenant House, a home for runaway teens. His title is Pastoral Minister. Those who know him call him Father Steve. For seven years, Father Steve has cruised the streets of the gambling mecca in a dirty old Covenant House van looking for homeless people and runaways. And when he finds them, he sits for a couple hours and just talks to them. He gives them a few dollars. Later, he he returns with blankets or another cardboard refrigerator box to improve their accommodations. He's jumping fences. He's Under the boards, he's into the abandoned buildings, says the Atlantic City Rescue Mission official, who has known Father Steve for years. He's got the right heart for this business. He invests all of his energy into it. He's out till 2 or 3 in the morning rescuing kids, trying to make a way for them. It's not surprising that Father Steve knows how runaways think. At 17, he ran away from his North Philadelphia home. He lived in the streets and hung out in the luncheonettes where he would wait until a diner left a table so that he could swoop in and eat the leftovers before the waitress could take the plate away. Father Steve's work 
takes a toll. His most painful memory is of a 15-year-old who was living beneath the boardwalk. He kept visiting, begging her to come in from the cold. One day he found her curled up, barely moving. The sand beneath her was pink. As he carried her to the van, she begged, don't forget my knapsack. He grabbed the bag and took her to the hospital. A doctor could find nothing wrong with her. When Father Steve told the girl, she said, go get my knapsack. Inside was her deceased newborn. The first step in approaching teens, says Father Steve, is building trust. Eventually, he hopes they will come in from the cold and get a meal, a shower, some medical attention. I tell them, just call your mom. Tell her you're alive. You don't have to tell her where you are. Sometimes things just start to happen that way. She cries when she hears her mother's voice or her mother cries when she hears her daughter's voice. And sometimes that's all it takes. That's all that is required. Love builds a bridge back home. But listen. What we have is not only a story of a priest seeking runaways. What we have here is our story, yours and mine. We, unworthy as we are, have been invited into the king's house for a great banquet. The admission has been paid in our behalf. Our only ticket is Christ himself. Do you have your ticket in hand? Do you have your ticket? It's here today in Christ. Just ask Him into your heart. His hand is out. Your ticket is in His hand, literally. If you have never been baptized, when things become normal again, we would love to make that arrangement and make that happen for you. If you've never join this church, you would like to become a member, please let us know. We would love to make that happen as well. Today, know that the Lord our God has made a way for everyone to experience His grace. Let us join together in our hymn of response. Say
If you're in need, we will be glad to see if it is in our power to help you. Remember to pray this week for God hears our prayers and whatever is on your heart, He hears that and and He will help you and He will address that. Now to the one who is able to hold you up, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Some sweet day I'll